Good morning, church. Thank you for joining us here on Sunday, November 29th, the first week of Advent. Um, we are here. What a year it has been. Um, my dates and calendars, you know, are all uh, all screwed up, it seems, this year. This week, you know, it was difficult to uh, think about it as Thanksgiving week. Uh, my family and I, we were planned uh, to go to Ohio to be with Carrie's parents for Thanksgiving. But because of the increase of numbers and the condition of everything in the country right now of, of COVID, uh, we, we canceled that trip to, to kind of just be safer, uh, you know, for them. And, uh, and so we're here. And so Thanksgiving for us this year was, uh, was our family and uh, just uh, around the table and, and giving thanks for those things and looking forward to, uh, to maybe next year where we could be together. But, um, and so sometimes, you know, it, it doesn't quite feel when we don't have those markers of, uh, you know, traditions and things that uh, we always do at the time. It cannot always feel like uh, the season is already upon us, but it is. And uh, maybe God has some great things for us this year as we reflect upon him in this Advent Christmas season as we wait and we long, um, which is what the season is about, and spend a little more time being still and knowing that he is God and thinking about the gifts uh, of Jesus and what that really means, especially this year when we maybe don't have as many of the things that could distract us. You know, I know every year at Christmas, you know, when we come to the end of it, we always say, boy, it was so busy. I wish it wasn't so busy with all these programs and all these, you know, activities and and things, you know, we kind of miss the reason for the season. Well, this year, <laughs> this year, we won't have that. This year is your chance to make Christmas about Jesus and to really reflect upon the gift of hope and peace and joy and the love of Christ and the gift of your salvation and eternal life to really think about all that that God has wanting to do in the world and what we still wait for what we still long for as we look around the world not not exactly what God had wanted yet you know and maybe you know again this is our chance and during Advent to remember that we still wait we wait for the return of Christ and the fulfillment of his kingdom and when peace will finally come to all when every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And so we still await a little bit. We maybe even await, you know, we're all waiting, you know, a vaccine. And we're waiting for maybe life to, to return in some ways that, that we miss it. So we're still waiting. But what does God want to teach us in this season of waiting? I think about John 1, where it says, you know, that in the midst of a world in darkness... That's when God sent his son. Light came into that darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. And so each week, you know, we light a, a candle in the Advent uh, wreath there. Again, to, to again, remember that light has come into the world. Our Lord is with us. God is with us. Emmanuel. And we celebrate at Christmas this wonderful gift of hope. And uh, so I hope that you will... Uh, Celebrate that and think more about it, uh, not just in this service, um, but over the next month as we get closer to Christmas. Uh, a few announcements as we begin today. First is this, that our quilt auction uh, is ending soon. And so we have just uh, today and tomorrow that you can bid on those quilts. Again, the link is in your church email if you would like to look at that. And then um, we thank you for the amazing number, over 100 or so, of Christmas shoeboxes that were made and donated. Um, now we have one final way you can give this Christmas over this next month, if you would like. And that is that um, we are going to be putting together a whole bunch of stockings for our residents at the Waverly Care Center, as well as the homeless in Lincoln through Matt Talbot Kitchen. And so we have lists. They'll be on your church email, or you can pick them up here in the church foyer. Um, but lists of what items 
we are going to stuff into those stockings good items for people, residents of the care facility or for the homeless, you know. And um, if you wanted to purchase those items and bring them in, we are going to be stuffing those stockings. The stockings will be made by our quilters. Um, and so that adds a whole nother level of, of a beauty of gift that we're trying to give. But over the next month, as you're thinking about buying things for one another, um, think about buying something for a resident at the care facility or one of the many homeless in our city. Um, and let's show them the love of Christ, too. And then finally, I just wanted to mention our Advent bags. And hopefully you got those delivered to you this week. If you did not receive one um, and we overlooked your name, please call me. We apologize for that. Or if you're not in our church directory and you would like one of these um, to help you during your month of worshiping the Lord and, and thinking more about him, just call me up or uh, text me there at the church office and, and uh, we'll get one right, right out to you. But inside it has our Advent devotional and that starts today. And, and it has a reflection for each day um, leading up to Christmas. Um, and it's a scripture reading as well as a reflection by somebody from our church who wrote it. They're very good. Um, it also has in there some candles, um, uh, three purple, one pink, and one white, so that you can make your own Advent wreath at home and light your candles along with us as we light them uh, soon here in the service. Um, it'll also have in there some treats. If you have any children, it will have uh, a little homemade gift uh, for them and some craft stuff. And then there will also be in there a baggie with some candles for Christmas Eve. And um, we are going, it is our hope, to still have our Christmas Eve service here, maybe even two of them to kind of spread out people. Um, and so you could uh, bring those along with you as you come to Christmas Eve service. Or if you are going to be worshiping from home this year, uh, we uh, will be posting our Christmas Eve service online as well. And you can be able to light that candle and sing along with us uh, to Silent Night uh, from home there, if that is what you choose to. But those are just to help you, again, during this season, uh, be able to make this season really about Jesus Christ, like we say every year is with all the distractions and all the programs. Well, this year we don't have them as many, and so um, maybe this year can be all about Jesus. And what a wonderful, the greatest gift of all that we celebrate. And so as we enter into this service, um, we're going to have the Wellings who will share and light the Advent candle and read that. Uh, we have a trio that is going to be singing, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Um, and then uh, we will have Jessica Eden bringing the sermon for us. Again, like I said, I was planning to go to Ohio, and so I'd schedule Jessica to preach for us this morning. But even though I'm here today, uh, she has prepared an uh, amazing message. It, uh, I've already listened to it um, as she is recorded now for this service, um, and it is terrific about hope. Um, a lot of great insights there you're going to want to hear as you start your Christmas season. She does a fabulous job. So she'll bring the message for us. But I want to read this scripture from Isaiah 9. Verse 2 and then also 6 and 7, it says, The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on until forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. God bless you. Lighting a candle is a simple act that has been around forever. For most of the world's history, this was how one got light at night. It is a testimony to the power of light over darkness. Even the light of one candle can shine up a whole room or guide the way for us to see the path. The Waverly Marching Band program this year was Light a Candle in the Window, telling the story of when slaves were on the run to safety and knew which home was a safe spot by the candle in the window. John 1.4 says, In him was life, and the life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
This scripture speaks about our Savior who came to shine the way for us and is the true light of the world. In him we see who we are, who God is, and what life truly is about. The first candle we light in the Advent wreath is called the Hope Candle. It reminds us of the prophecy and the long wait of God's people for the Messiah. Isaiah 2, 2 through 5 says, In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. Come, descendants of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Dear God, thank you so much for the truth that you are and the light that you show us when we are in despair and in this time of what we see around us, darkness with sickness and, and trouble and in our own lives, we need to be shown the way, um, your way. And I do pray in this Advent, Advent season that you would continue to be that light for us, that we can see the way before us. And thank you that you will be there to guide us. Thank you all for joining us in worship online today. Before we get begin, I just want to say a quick word of prayer as we start. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just um, thank you for being with us here today, being um, present with each and every one of us. Uh, we just pray that you um, give us an opportunity to think and clearly hear from you today as um, we learn about what it is when you give us your hope. Amen. 
Well, before I get started, I do just want to take a quick moment to say thank you to all of you for the past 11 months that I've gotten to work with our kids and our kids' ministry. It has been so fun and so encouraging to kind of watch them grow and experience what it's been like to live into kids' ministry in the last year. So it's been a blast, and I just want to say thank you for the encouragement and support you've given me. Um, you know, this is the start of our Advent season. We are on the first Sunday of Advent as we kind of prepare and anticipate for the coming of Christ and the birth at Christmas. And so the first week of Advent is the week of hope. But before I talk about hope, we all love Christmas. So I just want to spend a few minutes talking about the great things with Christmas. And as Jason and I have kind of figured out together what our Christmas looks like as we blend both our family traditions, most of them have gone pretty well. Um, but recently we discovered something that we didn't agree on. And it started a few weeks ago when Jason was organizing a closet with the kids. And they happened to pull the Christmas tree out of the closet. And I heard him in kind of the background as I'm doing something else say to the kids, well, let's go ahead and take the Christmas tree upstairs and start decorating for Christmas. And very quickly and probably a little too loudly, I yelled, no, you can't do that. We were all probably a little bit shocked that I um, reacted so suddenly, but it turns out that this was something I was um, fairly adamant about, about when you decorate for Christmas. Now, I know some of you are thinking, yeah, she's right. You can't decorate for Christmas until the day after Thanksgiving. And the other you of you out there are thinking, no way, you have to start decorating at least in October because you don't get enough of the Christmas season. Well, I can tell you for sure that my family um, did align with what I was thinking was correct because we didn't until the day after Thanksgiving around 8 a.m. start decorating for Christmas when I put away my fall decorations and got out our Christmas ones. So that one we've now come to agreement on that that is the correct way to decorate for Christmas. You know, but there's plenty of other things that we have agreed upon, and one of those is Christmas movies. Now, as a family, we love sitting down and watching a good Christmas movie together, and I really love most of them, from Elf and Grinch, It's a Wonderful Life, Miracle on 34th Street, The Santa Claus, Home Alone, you name it, I love watching movies. Now, one of the most common Christmas movies out there, or most popular, is actually A Christmas Carol. And most of you are probably familiar with The Christmas Carol, but the main character is Ebenezer Scrooge. And Mr. Scrooge is kind of a sour old man. And he has the opportunity on Christmas Eve, and he is visited by three different spirits. The spirit of Christmas past, the spirit of Christmas present, and the spirit of Christmas future. Now these spirits lead him to see himself in these different positions as they kind of lead him, and he gets to see and experience this. Now for us, we're going to kind of take a hint from this movie and do the same thing. It's, we're going to look at hope. We're going to look at the hope of the Israelites long ago, the hope of today, our present hope, and our future hope in Christ. So first, I just want to take a moment and read through our scripture passage for today, which is found in Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 7. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, but in the future he will honor the Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in great darkness have seen the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For to us a child is given, to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord will accomplish this. After spending some time studying this scripture, I truly feel like we can glimpse into hope in those three distinct ways. And so the first is the hope of the past. And this would be the people who originally heard this prophecy firsthand, the Israelites, God's chosen people. 
You know, at this time, the nation of Israel was kind of in disarray. And you can kind of see this in the words used in our scripture text with words like gloom, distress, walking in darkness. Now, this was both kind of their heart feeling as well as kind of their physical position at the time. And so the Israelite people were lost and the prophet Isaiah presented them with something new, this, this idea of hope. Each of those first five verses in our text remind us of the gloom and despair that the Israelites were in, but they all finish with this underlayment of hope. Now, hope is an incredible word, and so before I go too much further, I do want to talk about what the word hope means. Hope in its original Hebrew is mikvah, or its feminine version, tikvah. Now, tikvah can be translated directly as hope, as we know it, or it can also be translated as a cord, as in like an attachment to something. So I don't know if you've seen this um, kitten meme that's kind of been circulating the internet for quite a few years, but it's a picture of a cat holding onto a rope and the words at the top say, just hang in there. Well, this is just a perfect image for Tikva because this cord the cat's holding onto is its hope. It It is planning on this to pull it through and save him from despair, from falling down. So this cat has complete hope in this cord knowing that it will save him. And as Christians, as believers, we too have a hope and we hold on to the hope of Christ. Our hope is so much better because we get the beauty of what it says in verse six. It says, he will be called wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. The description of our cord is Christ and that hope is way better than the rope that the cat gets. The one place in scripture that I really love the word tikvah used is in the story of Rahab. Now, Rahab was not an Israelite. She did not worship our God. She was actually kind of on the opposite team. She was an enemy of of the Israelite people. And so in the story of Rahab, God actually sends two Israelite spies into her town to scope it out. Now, the people in Rahab's city had kind of heard some rumors about the Israelite God and were kind of becoming a little fearful. And Rahab happens to run into these spies and out of fear, perhaps for this God that she wasn't so sure about, she decides to help the Israelite spies. So she guards and protects them and is able to save them from her people. And so in return, she asks these spies to save her. And she wants to know, like, will you save me when your army comes back to invade our city? And so they do. They agree and they say, yes, we will save you when we come back. But then you ask the question, how is the Israelite army going to know that Rahab is Rahab? It's a whole lot of people on that Israelite army and a whole bunch of people in her city. It's a good question. Well, the Israelite spies tell her to tie a cord in her window to symbolize that she is Rahab and her family. Do you have any idea what word the Israelite spies used when they told her to tie that cord in her window? You got it. It's tikva. So this cord was the exact hope that Rahab and her family clung to to pull them through this horrible situation. Rahab was in a dire and desperate situation, and she needed hope. Just like if we fast forward to the Israelites in our scripture, they were also in this desperate situation, and they too needed hope. Since the Israelite people had started having earthly kings, they kind of depended on these kings for peace and comfort and safety. But for the most part, the kings that did rise to power didn't have the greatest influence or success on the people. There was always, or for the most part, another nation trying to conquer or invade. And when the kings did bring religious reforms, they weren't always very successful. So when Isaiah came and spoke, he gave them something to hold on to, this concept of hope. He gave them a cord to hold on to in their troubling times. They needed to be reminded that although they were walking in darkness at that time, that one day they would see a great light. They needed to be reminded that one day they would feel the accomplishment of a military conquest. They needed to hear that one day the rod of their oppressors would be no more. Fortunately for us, we have the opportunity to actually look back in scripture on this time the Israelites had and see the foreshadowing of Christ and be reminded of that hope that they had. For the Israelites, they clung to this hope as best they could because it would be over 700 years before the prophecy came true in the coming Messiah. So that brings us to the hope of Christmas present. 
this is the second way we can see hope and to me perhaps the most clear way we can see it because we are in the Christmas season. We see Christmas lights being put up all throughout the city. We hear Christmas music on the radio and we still get to celebrate Christmas. No matter how hard COVID-19 is going to try, we still get the holiday. It's not just going to get wiped off the calendar. You know, the Israelites, they too had feasts and celebrations throughout the year to kind of refocus and get their attention back on God. And God gives us this too in Christmas. Each Christmas, we can refocus and realign our priorities and our focus and put it back on Christ. We get the opportunity to reflect on what the Israelites knew, but we also get it so much better because we know that very special year, the prophecy finally came true. In verse 6, it says, For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Each and every Christmas season we have, we get to be reminded of and rejoice in our current hope, our Christ. This man came, this God came to us in the form of a tiny baby to bring us hope we never even could have imagined. Every time, too, that we open our Bibles, we see our present hope. We see it both in God's character as well as we see it how he works in our lives. Our kids' ministry has actually been learning about this, too, as they've been working on our Wednesday night program to memorize Philippians 1.6, which says, God began a good work in you, and I am sure that he will carry it on until it is completed, and that will be on the day Christ Jesus returns. We get to have hope knowing that God has begun a good work in you, and each and every day he is completing it a little bit more to make you the best you can be. Doesn't that give you hope that right now God is working the good in you each and every moment? He is the God of hope because he gives us all hope in all aspects. He has given us this promise of hope truly because he is a God of hope. In Romans 15, 13, it says, Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is right now through his spirit working working and increasing our hope in our lives. He's already told us and given us the promise that he is at work within us, and he will continue to do this until he returns. We need to be reminded of this hope and rely on the truths found in Scripture throughout the Bible that God of, our God of hope is at present, and he is at work within us both now and forevermore. The final way we look at hope, too, is from the hope of Christmas future. Now, our future hope is my favorite part and probably the best part of our scripture today because we are not the Israelites waiting, hoping for the Messiah, and we do get to celebrate Christmas in a nation with religious freedom. So we really have to pause and think deeply about why is our future hope so special? Well, our hope for the future is knowing that we have an everlasting Father with us at all times, and we get to anticipate in the season of Advent his coming again. Listen again to verse 7. It says, Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. So twice in this verse, we are comforted knowing that Jesus is not just giving us hope today, but he's giving us hope for eternity. He continues to give us our future hope by saying that his kingdom is endless. His reign will never end, and the cord he gives us, his hope in his his hope and the Jesus in our lives, that is the hope that we can hold on to and we know will never end. If we can think back for a moment to the just hang in there cat, we can see that the cat was holding on with every ounce of his being to this rope, hoping that it would bring him through this trial. But <laughs> most likely we know that the cat lost its grip and fell down, hopefully landing safely, maybe minus one of his nine lives or so. His cord was not the right cord of hope because it didn't pull him through the trial. But we so often do the same thing. We have cords we hold on to thinking that they are helpful and lasting and will always be there, but they, they don't. They give way at some point in time, especially during this year when we think we are holding on to a strong and secure cord, but then it gives way. For me, I have cords in my life that I hold on to thinking they'll be good as well. I have cords like my household order cord or the school cord or my job cord and probably a dozen or so others. And like most of us, I was pulling on these on a daily basis to feel secure and feel that I was confident in what I was doing. 
And then March hit. And we all kind of experienced something of the same thing because I started pulling on my school cord and all of a sudden my school cord gave way when I was no longer taking my kid to school. And then I pulled on my job cord, which I knew what to do based on this description I was given. And you know what? It's really hard to do kids ministry when you can't, when they don't have social media, phones, or emails. It's, turns out it's hard to get in touch with them in, without those methods. So I pulled on that and that gave way. And then for me, I'm type A and I have my household order and my clean cord. And for me, as long as I can at least try to keep things in order, maybe not always clean, it helps me stay sane. And then, of course, we all know March hit and all five of my family were staying at home 24 hours a day with no place to go. I have this theory that my kids, when they eat, they um, suck up all their crumbs and they hide them in places that I don't know where. And they suck them up and then the moment I clean my floors and I clean the house, they walk out and I think they just shake all their crumbs out all throughout the house. I don't know how it happens, but you can imagine when we were all living there together, I, I, my sanity was tried because my household order cord just gave way. Now, maybe you can relate to those or maybe you have other cords you hold on to as well. Maybe you have a family cord that you pull on and we were used to seeing our family and then all of a sudden March came and coronavirus started and we were quarantining and we were no longer able to see our family in the traditional ways. Or maybe you had a financial cord that you were relying on money from a job or from some other means and all of a sudden that gave way when a job was lost or something else happened during this season. Or maybe you have a time cord and you are so busy day in and day out and day in and out doing the same things in this perfect schedule over and over and then everything went away. And now we have to really think and pray about what we put back into our schedules and prioritize it well. We all have these cords and these cords that we hold on to, but they are not always the right cord. We so often forget, too, that there is only one cord that also holds on to us. We've been holding on to all these other cords of hope that have given way, but there's only one cord that holds on to us, and we must remember to hold on to it. Our cord is Christ. We have to remember to hold on to him because he is the only cord, the only hope that is our past, present, and future. He will always be there. In your Advent bags, among some other goodies that you were given, there's a small red piece of yarn or thread or string. And um, you probably thought, what is it doing in here? It probably just fell in my bag. It, it doesn't mean anything. Well, I hope that you can see that this red cord or string means so much more. Like the red cord that Rahab hung in her window as a symbol that she and her family had hope and were saved, I want this red string and cord to be a hope to you that you have a past, present, and future hope in Christ that it is something we can cling to in our desperate and troubling times, that it's never going to weigh because Christ is our everlasting hope. Use this cord, put it on your Christmas tree, put it in your Bible as a bookmark, hang it on a window so that every time you or your family walk by, you are reminded of the hope that you have in Christ because he is a cord that will never give way because he is an everlasting hope, a hope that has no end because our Christ is a wonderful counselor, a mighty God, an everlasting Father, and he is our Prince of Peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, just thank you for this time together um, as we worship in, in new ways. Lord, we pray that you are just surrounding us with your hope as we begin the Advent season. Lord, remind all of us that you are our hope now and forevermore. Amen.